Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a significant impact on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Jenny Rivera, who died recently in a plane crash at the age of 43. Jenny Rivera was a popular singing star in the southwestern United States and in Mexico. She was the diva of banda music. And if you're unfamiliar with banda music, it's Mexican music. It originated in Mexico in the late 19th century. It's very heavy on the horns and on the tuba. It was influenced by German music because there were a lot of Germans in southwestern United States and in northern Mexico in the late 19th century. Here's a little bit of what it sounds like. <laughs> She was born in Southern California to Mexican parents. Jenny Rivera had a tough childhood, and she used banda music to emphasize female empowerment. In a sense, she was a little bit like Madonna. She didn't flaunt her sexuality like Madonna, but she was definitely a message singer emphasizing the power of the female. Here's Lester Holt and NBC with a report on Jenny Rivera. And there is late word from Mexico tonight that searchers have found what appears to be plane wreckage near where an American-registered corporate jet went missing this morning with Latin music superstar Jenny Rivera on board. Tonight, from here in her native Southern California to across Latin America, fans and colleagues of the three-time Grammy nominee are expressing shock and grief over the fate of Rivera and the six other people who were on board the jet. There were no reported signs of survivors at the apparent crash site. NBC's Miguel Almaguer is outside Rivera's home in Encino, California, with the latest. Miguel? Lester, good evening. Jenny Rivera has always maintained a home here in Southern California. She has massive crossover appeal both in the United States and Mexico. And as you mentioned, late word tonight, they may have found the missing star. Mexican-American singing sensation Jenny Rivera, who has sold some 20 million records, a mother of five who recently filed for divorce, Rivera was born in Long Beach, California to immigrant parents. In the mid-90s, she became a breakout crossover star. Her self-titled release, Jenny, became her first number one album in the Billboard Top Latin Albums chart. Known as La Diva de la Banda for her style of Mexican music, Rivera's career has been groundbreaking. Just last year, she sold out Staples Center in Los Angeles the first female Mexican artist to ever do so. I love Jenny. Segunda temporada. Mundo.tv slash Jenny. A reality TV star with her film debut set for next month. No doubt she is one of the biggest stars in the Hispanic community. For years, her fans have followed her life like the episodes of a telenovela. Salud. Well, tragically, it looks like Jenny Rivera was just breaking into the crossover mainstream. We won't have an opportunity to appreciate the talent that she showed. The list of famous musicians who died in plane crashes is quite long. It includes Glenn Miller, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, Patsy Cline, Jim Reeves, Ronnie Van Zant, John Denver, Otis Redding, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jim Croce, and Rick Nelson. And unfortunately to that list, we now have to add Jenny Rivera. Our feature tonight is Berger Stromsheim, who died recently at the age of 101. And Berger Stromsheim was a Norwegian who was involved in one of the most daring sabotage plots in history that took place during World War II. The background of the story is this. During World War II, Germany occupied Norway very early in the war. In an isolated region known as Telemark in the center of Norway, in a gorge area, the Germans noticed that heavy water was being produced as a byproduct of fertilizer production. Heavy water is essentially the same as regular water except it has a slightly denser form of hydrogen which makes it about 10% more dense as a liquid than regular water. The occupation of Norway and Telemark had a strategic importance because of this heavy water, because nuclear fission had been discovered right before World War II, and both the Allies and the Germans realized the importance of nuclear fission in possibly developing the atomic bomb. The Germans, led by their scientific genius Werner Heisenberg, who was in charge of their nuclear program, felt that heavy water would be the appropriate substance to moderate nuclear fission reactions in order to produce a controlled detonation. One of the things that we talked about when we did Robert Christie about a month ago. 
the Allies, the Americans and the British, decided to opt against heavy water because of its scarcity, and they felt that you could moderate the nuclear fission reaction with pure carbon graphite instead. So by the early 1940s, the race to develop an atomic bomb was on with the Allies using graphite and the Germans using heavy water that they imported from the Telemark region of Norway from a top-secret heavily guard plant named Norsk Hydro at the bottom of the gorge in a small city named Vormark. Ultimately, the Germans lost the race for the atomic bomb for three reasons. The first was they lost many of the best and most brilliant scientists who were Jewish who were forced to emigrate in the 1930s due to Hitler's racial policies. Many of those scientists came to the United States and worked on the Manhattan Project. The second was the German strategy of fighting war on three fronts forced them to divert much of their military resources to conventional warfare, and a lot of the money, materiel, and manpower that might have been used to develop the atomic bomb was instead diverted to conventional arms, tanks, and aircraft. The third and final reason was Heisenberg's gamble on heavy water instead of graphite, and this is where Berger Stromshine comes in. Although the Norsk Hydro plant was top secret, British intelligence figured out what was going on there and what it was being used for. In their own top secret plan, the British military recruited several Norwegians who were familiar with the territory, who had left Norway when the Nazis invaded. They were to fly them over the area, have them parachute into the rough region, and then have them ski into the area of the Norsk Hydro plant, blow up the plant, and then make their way several hundred miles on skis into neutral Sweden. The mission was to be led by a man named Joachim Rottenberg. All of the men recruited for the mission were in their 20s, except Berger Stromshine, who was 31. He was the oldest, and he was the demolitions expert. Years later, Rottenberg recalled him as the best man of the group. In 1942, an earlier mission had failed. When the volunteers were stranded, they were ultimately captured, tortured, and killed by the Germans. So in February 1943, Rottenberg, Stromshine, and the others became the second group to parachute into Telemark make their way to the Norsk Hydro plant at Vormark, attempt to blow up the plant and escape safely, destroy the heavy water supply of the Germans, and keep Heisenberg and the scientists in Germany from developing the atomic bomb. Here is a 1973 BBC report on what actually happened in the Telemark heavy water sabotage plant. So one by one they dropped. This was the inventory of the equipment that each man brought for an indefinite but hopefully not inactive visit to Belmont. Norwegian currency issued by the Bank of England. British battle dress with Norwegian shoulder flashes for wearing under white snow camouflage suits. Canadian ski boots, Norwegian skis. Long John pants, string vests, dried fruit, raisins, pemmican, cigarettes, chocolate, tommy guns, grenades, pistols, and jelly knife. In one rucksack, there was a piece of special equipment. A pair of wire cutters which could cut through an inch of steel like butter. They'd been bought by Renneberg during the pub crawl while training in Cambridge. They had landed 40 miles northwest of Vermont and were soon all feeling sick with high fevers and inflammation of the neck glands from the near lethal change of climate. Now they had to find the advance party, February the 23rd. After the worst blizzard of the winter, which had raged for five days, the gunner side group set out in search of their colleagues. They sighted two men moving feebly on their ski. They could see they were near starvation. Their eyes were sunken and their skin was yellow, but they were from the advance party. The two groups had met, February the 26th. How could they best reach the factory? By the bridge spanning the river 300 feet below or by the gorge itself? The bridge had a 24-hour guard. It was covered from the factory by machine guns and searchlights. The pipes leading to the factory and the perimeter were mined. Klaus Helberg, born in Rücken, was sent to find the answer. I found a way down to the gorge, uh, rather steep but not too difficult. I crossed the river and up on the other side. It wasn't so difficult. Uh, we, we could get down in daylight. It uh, would, of course, be a little more difficult in the uh, night time. But uh, I uh, told them that uh, we would manage to cross it in night time. There was a railway leading to the factory at the back. They would cross the gorge by Holberg's route and enter by the railway gate. Once inside the perimeter, they would split into two groups, the covering party to the German guard hut and the demolition party to the heavy water plant. February the 27th. Led by Renneberg, the nine men began the long trek down to Vermont. The radio operator was left behind to report the outcome to London. All had been trained in England on such accurate models of the factory that one saboteur said he knew it better than his own back guard. Norwegian guards were to be bound and gagged. German guards, 15 always on duty, to be put out of action as circumstances demand. The destruction of the stocks of fluid 
took precedence over everything else. So that they would not involve local people in German reprisals if they were captured, they were to attack in full British battle dress. We knew that if we were caught, we were most likely shot. I think it was the feeling of the whole group that you shouldn't be taken prisoner. One of the ways of escaping that was to, to use this uh, poisonous pill we had. It was recommended to all the chaps before the operation. I remember I repeated it. It might be a very good idea to use this pill in case of difficulty, to be quite certain that you didn't give anything away. It was now near midnight. A thaw had set in at the lower level and the river at the bottom of the gorge had to be crossed on a single remaining strip of ice that lay three inches below the snow line. They could see the sentry's post on the bridge above. The attack began 30 minutes after midnight. The door to the heavy water plant was locked. They did not force it. They had been told in England about a narrow funnel leading to the plant. It was the intake for the high-tension electric cables, a two-foot space through which a man with equipment might just squeeze. There was only one Norwegian watchman, Gustav Johansson, he was held at gunpoint while Rönneberg himself laid half-minute fuses to reduce risk of discovery to a minimum and give them just time enough to withdraw. The explosion itself was not very loud at all. It was, I should say, like two or three cars crashing together on Piccadilly Circuit. It was a rather anticlimax because uh, we have been waiting for half a year nearly for this bang and it was, it was very impressive. We had an English password. Piccadilly Circus and answer Leicester Square. And uh, I remember uh, when we got outside the gate, we heard a voice saying Piccadilly Circus. And I got the answer, shut up. One man, as planned, deliberately left his Tommy gun in the snow as final proof that the attack was a military operation executed from Britain. First on the scene after the attack was Alf Larsen. When I got in through the door, I could see that all the high concentration cells had been blown up. Every The bottom was knocked out of each individual cell. I could also uh, see that the whole room was uh, full of spray of water. This obviously being caused by shrapnel from the explosions having penetrated um, water tubes to the plant. And the whole room was actually well, like being in a shower, more or less. And it then struck me that this is the perfect sabotage. And the signal went back to Britain. Operation carried out with 100% success. High concentration plant completely destroyed. Shots not exchanged since Germans did not realize anything. The operation destroyed one ton of heavy water. It took three months to rebuild the plant before production was resumed. Churchill asked what rewards are to be given to these heroic men. Four DSOs, three military crosses, and five military medals were awarded. This was the most highly decorated sabotage group in the history of the Second World War. General von Falkenhorst called the attack the most splendid coup I have seen in this war. In April 1945, an Allied mission drove deep into Germany. Hidden in a cave beneath the church at Heigerloch near the Black Forest, they found the German atomic reactor. This was the first concrete proof of their suspicion that the Germans really had lost the race for the atomic bomb. Digging deeper, they found buried in a field the uranium cubes needed for building a reactor. And in a nearby mill, the last of the Norwegian heavy water hidden in oil barrel. Shortage of heavy water had been crucial in holding up German atomic experiments. <laughs> When the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in August 1945, it was the Allies who had built it. It killed 75,000 people. If Hitler had made an atomic bomb, he would certainly have used it on London. And this was a possibility which the British could not afford to ignore. So Burger Stromschein was part of the perfect sabotage, the destruction of the heavy water plant at Telemark. Ironically, in 1965, Hollywood made a movie about Telemark called The Heroes of Telemark, starring Kirk Douglas and Richard Harris. And naturally, they Hollywooded it up. There were gunfights, there were chases, there were women. And Berger Stromschein was offended by it. The actual operation had none of those things. It was perfectly planned, it was surreptitious, and it was meticulously executed under conditions of great danger. There was physical danger in the train, and there was the existential danger of the Nazis. Berger Stromschein and the heroes of Telemark, the real heroes of Telemark, that is, managed to avoid all of that. And without them, who knows what would have happened. Perhaps Heisenberg would have developed the atomic bomb, and Hitler would have used it on England, the Soviet Union, or on Europe itself. We owe Berger Stromschein our gratitude. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Taps, 
and as a final tribute to Berger Stramsheim, we're going to play a classical piece from the greatest composer from his home country of Norway. This is from the Pyrgin Suite by Edvard Grieg. It's the concluding portion from In the Hall of the Mountain King. <laughs> 